on and let's talk about the sacrifices in this um, in this portion. This portion consists of teaching us about the sacrificial offerings, the karbanot. The word karban karban means to come close, but the Lubavitcher Rebbe has a nice way of de of describing these. Really, it's not you know sometimes the Rebbe writes and it's the Rebbe's own unique uh, way of of saying something. Here, it's really just a nice outline. So to understand that there are four basic types of sacrifices in the Jewish tradition. And if we don't say this at the beginning, people will be confused and they won't, and, and we'll always be catching up and the whole thing will seem blurry to us. So we need to understand there are four basic sacrifices. There's an Ola, which is an ascent offering, which uh, this basically, the basic point of this is to express the desire of the person who offers it to come to a higher level of closeness to God, either because they intentionally did not do a positive commandment of the Torah, or, or also they, well, so that's the basic idea that the Gemara tells us, I think it's in Zvachim, that the Ola is brought if you didn't do a positive commandment. That's a really only, if, as, as I recall the Gemara, that's really only one position in the uh, in the in the Gemara there but it's but but some say you just have a strong desire to come close to God that's the Ola offering uh, a second type of offering is a peace offering a shlamim a shlamim is called a peace offering because everyone is able to partake in in a peace offering meaning to say everyone gets a portion of it some goes on the altar, some goes to the some goes to the Kohen to eat, and some goes to the um, some goes to the owner of the offering to eat. Then there's a sin offering called a chatas. A chatas is a sin offering where if you would have done this sin intentionally, you would be liable for the severe penalty from heaven called kares. But when it's done accidentally, you bring a chatas, and then there's an asham offering, which is called a guilt offering. There are several different types of these carbon ashams. Uh, one of them, which we've been studying in the nazir, is, is if a nazir becomes accidentally tame, he brings this carbon asham. So, so I think this is what the, uh, the Rebbe writes. An example of transgressing an act of commandment that it's no longer possible to perform, which you would bring in Ola, is let's say you didn't recite the Shema in this proper time. You woke up late, you didn't recite the Shema, so then you'd have to bring in Ola. But um, another example of where you'd have to bring in Ola is if you stole something from a person and then the person died, so you can't return it to them, so then you'd have to bring a carbon Ola. What about a transgression? So this is what the Rebbe writes. Why do we have to bring this sacrificial offering? So the Rebbe writes, God forgives us for our misdeeds as soon as we've repented properly. Meaning to say, we regretted having committed the misdeed. We confessed for it. We don't have to go to the rabbi to confess. We just confess our guilt to God. And then we resolve not to repeat our mistake. If an... If this, this is if it's our relationship between us and God. If it was to another person, we first, before we can confess to God, we have to express our regret to this other person and the other person has to forgive us. However, in order to not only be forgiven, i.e. absolved from God's punishment, but also be reinstated in his good graces, meaning to say it's one thing to be forgiven, Another is to again be reinstated into the inner chamber of God. Then, in order to do that, we have to require we're required to bring a carbon, a carbon oa, or a, a carbon. So, this is what the Rebbe writes, and you can argue whether or not you believe this. The Rebbe writes, spending money on an animal that we then watch be consumed in flames on the altar helps us to both dematerialize and spiritualize our lives. Now, I don't know if everybody's going to agree with that, but I put that out there, and the Rebbe himself is going to question that. 
So nowadays there's no longer a temple. So what do we do nowadays? So nowadays where there's no longer a temple, we can't offer sacrifices. Technically speaking, it may be possible, but it's really practically speaking impossible. So how do we become back into God's good graces? That would happen through fasting or charity or repentance. And so uh, basically we're giving to God some part of our physical selves. In the case of fasting, we're losing some of our body mass. In the case of charity, we're giving up the money we could have used for food. And so basically we're, we're destroying part of our physical property as a way of coming closer uh, to Hashem. So anyway, this is, and then he writes at the end, according to Nachmanes, a person may also bring a voluntary ascent offering simply as a means of spiritual growth. That's actually the Talmud. I don't know why they just attribute to Nachmanes. Excuse me. Finally, this is the part of the Rebbe that I thought was the most relevant for us. This institution of sacrifice seems counter to the teachings of the Torah. It seems counter to the teachings of the Torah. The idea of a sacrifice is counter. Not the least of which is that it involves a seemingly unnecessary taking of an animal life. A lot of people who, who are are very troubled by this. How could we, the Torah command us to kill an animal? Even from a cold technical point of view, why would the Torah ask us to take valuable property and burn it? Or at least part of it for no apparent benefit. It seems wasteful. With regard to the sacrifices that the ancients offered up before the giving of the Torah, we could assume that this is their way of expressing their submission to God. Fine, but that was before the Torah. But here we see that the Torah is actually commanding it and legislating it. So how do we how do we mesh that with the fact that the Torah tells us not to waste life, not to waste anything? And here we're just seemingly acting in a cruel manner. So the Rebbe's conclusion is. He writes, on the most basic contextual level of understanding the Torah, the only explanation for the seemingly anomalous ritual of the sacrifices. Now, this is the Rebbe. There are other explanations here, but this is the Rebbe's, is that it is meant to express our unswerving devotion to God's will. It sounds to me like the Rebbe is writing here that this is a hope, that this is just a, an example of our dedication to God. And if the God had told us to jump up 400 times, that would have been the equivalent. But God told us to do this. I am not completely comfortable with this explanation because it doesn't strike me as making, uh, as, as, as mining the deeper reasons or, or it's not seemingly giving anything deep, deeper explanation to these specific rituals. But now, but the, just before we conclude this paragraph, today our daily prayers are a reflection of the sacrifices offered up in the tabernacle. Yeah, this is what I like also. Just as with the sacrifices, it may seem illogical to waste our valuable time on praying when we could actually be doing something, even holy deeds, such as studying the Torah or performing some practical commandment. It is precisely by dedicating our valuable time and concentration to nothing other than getting closer to God that we connect Him in the most profound, intimate way. So basically, the, the way I take what the Rebbe is saying is that the power of the sacrifice is, is that God commanded us to do something and we're sacrificing ourselves, giving up something uh, in service of God. But there's nothing in necessarily innately spiritual about the action. This is uh, what the Rebbe was saying. Let me just pause here, see if anybody has any comments. <laughs> 